Does this I'm make not a difference? Mute. Can you hear me now? Yes. As, uh, can you hear me better? I cannot hear anybody else, though. Oh, okay. Bruce, can you hear me? I, I can, can hear, hear you, Andy, yes. Yeah, Hi, I Chris. can hear you all. I can hear Guilford. Yeah. All Guilford right, I got to fix me, so. Tracy, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Hi, Tracy. Hey. Am I coming? Great. Yeah. One, Hi, Kim. Hello. Three. We four. have. Looks like we have a quorum. Yes. There, there yeah. is. There, there's one person in the audience too. Just so you know. Oh. oh. Okay. They might be like Tate or. Sure. We can let them in. I guess. Right. Can we? Have we started your recording yet? Yes. Nope, yes. You're, yes. Um. So let me um, open this meeting by saying pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, the meeting of the uh, TAC is being conducted via remote participation. Um, so this is the call to order from for the um, October 20th meeting of the TAC. Um, and it looks like we have, is our guest here? Yes, Ben. I'm here. Yes, right. great. So we have a special guest who will be presenting and discussing trains in the valley. And here, could we just um, ask the attendee if he just wants to come in too? Okay, thank you. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm so sorry to uh, interrupt, I suppose. Uh, so uh, I'm a UMass student. We had an assignment to attend a public meeting. Okay. Um, and I saw this one on the community schedule. And I was like, uh, I, I thought, you know, a presentation on trains in the valley. Uh, sounded quite interesting, and I noticed there was a public comment period. So I, I will say I don't have a public comment to make. Okay. Um, but that's I was okay. hoping to see it. I hope that's all right. No, absolutely. I mean, the meetings are open to the public, so okay. um, you're welcome. And I mean, we can put you back in the audience if you want. So. Oh, uh, yeah. A audience would probably be better. I would hate to. I would okay, hate to interrupt. Okay, that's fine. Can you can you put him back out, Guilford? Do you have the the power? Let's see. But glad you're attending. Yes, yeah, thank welcome. You. You're welcome. welcome. Yeah. Thank you. My pleasure. I think I just moved him out. Okay, great. So we do have somewhat, we do have another person in here. So it's up to you. <clears throat> yeah, I guess we let them in and we just see. Like if it's Chris um Lindstrom or somebody else. So the number is 781-528-7257. You can talk. Yeah, it's Marcus. Sorry. I, oh great! Uh, technical difficulties. Yeah. Oh, thanks for calling us. So I'm uh, still in the car. I hate to be home by now. I'm oh. All right, uh, I'm going to turn you off and put you in the panel, Marcus. <laughs> thanks, Gilbert. Okay, great. And um, yeah, so let's get started. So um, I will just mention to you, I, um, Ben is going to be presenting for the bulk of the meeting, but that there is a TSO meeting at 630. And I know that Andy Steinberg needs to go to that and Guilford Mooring. Um, so I don't know, Andy, if you had any really quick updates for us or anything. Um, otherwise, we'll just turn the floor over to Ben to give his presentation. But no, I don't have any updates. Okay, We appreciate you coming, even though you have these meetings back to back. So Thank you. Glad to be here. Okay, Ben, so take it away. Okay, I'm going to share my screen, hopefully. Um, yep. Share. Hopefully you can see the first screen, first slide that I put together, is that correct? Mm -hmm. yes. yes. Okay, so I'm gonna spend about 20 to 25 minutes running through a slide deck that I put together, <clears throat> which, um, which will give an overview of our organization, a little bit of overview of uh, rail service in the region, but the bulk of the presentation will be uh, mostly on East-West Rail, sort of 
what's happened a little bit in the past because it's pretty difficult to summarize uh, probably 10 years of work in uh, 15 minutes um, and then talk about sort of what's happening next and then what uh, Amherst could get involved with. <clears throat> so as I said, I'm gonna do an overview here. I'm gonna talk about uh, also potential new rail service coming into the region uh, shortly, hopefully in a few years. Um, so this is just sort of a summary of the topics that I'm going to address. I should have flipped the screen before I started talking. So Trains in the Valley was uh, founded by myself and a gentleman named Zane Lamelski in Northampton back in 2016. Uh, we sort of modeled our group on a similar group that exists up in Vermont called the Vermont Rail Action Network. Uh, it's a community advocacy organization. We focus on improved and expanded passenger and freight service, freight rail service in the three counties that make up the Pioneer Valley. We really focus primarily on passenger rail, but we also spend time on freight rail, infrastructure, safety, and transparency. Because uh, there's a lot, and one of the reasons we started the group was uh, when I moved to this region about eight years ago with my wife who grew up in Northampton, it was very, very difficult to sort of find out what was going on with changes to the rail network here and, and new passenger service coming. And I mean, there was information in the newspaper, but very little information was available from MassDOT at that time. And even today, there's still very little information available, which is, you know, again, one of the reasons that we created the group. Uh, Trains the Valley is also one of the four founding members of a group called the Western Mass Rail Coalition, uh, which I really won't go into in this meeting, but if you want to discuss some more, we could talk about it in the Q&A. Um, just to give you a little bit of a flavor of the kind of thing we get, we get involved with, we often like to say we do what others can't do, won't do, or don't want to do. And uh, as you know, Amherst used to have rail service until late 2014, when the service, the Vermonter service was transitioned over to the north-south line that runs north of Springfield. Uh, but at, somehow, someone at Amtrak never got the memo that the signage should be taken down at the station. And that signage there hung around for a couple of years. And we started trying to figure out how to get the signage removed because it didn't make any sense to have signage for a station that didn't exist. Well, anyone who's dealt with Amtrak knows it's exceedingly difficult to work with Amtrak. Um, in the end, to make a long story short, we approached Congressman McGovern's office. We gave him a draft of a letter. He sent it uh, through channels. And within about three weeks, all the signage was finally removed. Uh, but that's sort of the, a little bit of a flavor of uh, sort of the really dozens or hundreds of things we've gotten involved with uh, over the last six, seven years. Um, so just a quick sort of overview of why we think rail service is important to our region. Uh, you know, obviously lets people travel longer distances without the use of a passenger, uh, sorry, uh, a personal vehicle, easier access to New York City, large metro areas like Montreal, New York, Boston, it's obviously environmentally friendly. Um, and it gives us a public transit option to Bradley Airport for many of us in the valley that there is no public transport option today to get to Bradley. The only option is basically up to drive. Um, and we also think that it, it increases the attractiveness of, of our region uh, as a place to live, visit and work, just as our proximity to the Mass Pike, Interstate 91 and Bradley Airport is. Uh, there, there, are, there is existing service in the region. The Hartford Line, which runs from Springfield down to New Haven and on to New York and Point South, there's approximately a dozen trains a day in each direction. Um, there's the Vermonter service, which is one train a day, which runs up, uh, starts in northern Vermont, runs through the valley, down to New York City and to Washington. There's the newer Valley Flyer service, which is a morning service southbound and an evening service or late evening service northbound, uh, which is sort of an add-on to the Vermonter, which has been picking up a fair amount of ridership now. And there's the Lakeshore Limited Service, which is in many sense, East-West Rail, because it's been operating for a couple of decades now between Boston and Albany with extended service that goes on to Chicago. 
the timing isn't great, but as we always like to say, one train is always better than no trains. So we're happy to have one train and that actually makes it easier in the long term to enhance the service running east west in the Commonwealth. So the potential for new service in our region includes expanded service or extension of the Vermonter up to Montreal. That service is in design now and waiting for some funding, which should come probably next year. Uh, obviously, East West Rail, where there's a lot of work going on, and I'm going to talk about that later in the presentation. And you're probably aware that there's a study also going on to look at the potential for service from between North Adams, Greenfield, and Boston, North Station. This is the so-called Northern Tier Pasture Rail Study. This opportunity is still at sort of the study phase. As you know, with transportation, big projects like this, everything has to go through a study really within MassDOT before you go ahead and do something. I mean, MassDOT doesn't add an exit on the Mass Pike without a study. So they're not gonna add rail service without a study. So we've had two studies for the East-West Rail Service. We're in our first study for the Northern Tier Pasture Rail potential service. Um, you know, and needless to say, there's a lot going on with pasture rail right now in Western Mass and on all sorts of levels, like did not exist 10 years ago. Excuse me for a moment. So just quickly to summarize what's happening with the Vermonter going to Montreal. Uh, this has been under discussion really since 1995 when Amtrak withdrew its overnight service, which was some of you may know it's called the Montrealer. Uh, that was a nice service to have, but it really didn't help us in the Valley because it went through in the middle of the night. If you wanted to get on at 2.30 in the morning in Northampton, that was great, but most people don't want to do that. So the effort is underway to extend the existing Vermonter service past its northern terminus in St. Albans up to Vermont. Uh, since 9-11, it's very, very difficult and complicated to do that kind of stuff to get over the border. But there are real steps happening now. There's efforts underway to build a pre-clearance facility at Montreal Central Station. If you've flown into Montreal before or any Canadian city from the United States, you know that you go through customs and immigration for either country uh, in Canada before you come to the United States. The same thing will apply to the train when it crosses the border. Uh, and there's a need for some upgrades to uh, the track between the international border and Montreal. If all goes well, this will happen in a couple of years. But if you'd asked me a couple of years ago when it was gonna happen, I would have said in a couple of years. So we're still waiting at this point. Now I'm gonna transition over to East West Rail. I'm gonna talk a little bit, very briefly about the history of this, talk about the political support that's there, the funding that's there, sort of what the next steps are and sort of what Amherst can do about this. Um, as one person said to me a couple of years ago, to make services like this happen, you really need two things. You need political will and you need money. And we didn't have that five, six, seven, ten 10 years ago, but the political will is there to do this now. And clearly the money is there to do this now. So now it's a matter of how do you get all the sort of technical things you have to do to design such a service, to implement such a service, you know, and to build such a service to make it happen. But now to quickly go through the brief history, uh, in between 2013 and 16, there was a very extensive study that was done called the Northern New England Intercity Rail Initiative. It looked at expanded service between New Haven, Springfield, and Boston, and also Montreal, Springfield, and Boston. Uh, the study was completed. They had 1,300 pages of output. They finally decided that there should be one new train from Boston to Montreal and eight new round trip trains between Boston, Springfield and New Haven with connections onto New York and no further action was taken after that study was done. Um, then uh, a lot of things happened between 2016 and 18 that I really won't go into, but uh, the governor made a decision, Governor Baker, to initiate a second study of East-West Rail Service uh, this study really looked at the potential for expanded service between Pittsfield, Springfield, and South Station. And the outcome of that was uh, 
you know, basically a three to $5 billion project, which would add somewhere between eight and 10 trains on this corridor in some number of years, whenever they could get around to building it. But there was not a decision made at the time the study was completed to move forward. They wanted basically effectively to consider, uh, sorry, continue with what they called the conceptual planning for East West Rail. So now move forward to May, 2021, um, Amtrak stepped up and said, and issued a, a nationwide sort of conceptual plan for how they wanted to build out their network to 2035. And included within that plan was additional service between Albany, Springfield and Boston. Uh, they wanted to add two additional trains as a start on this quarter. So they, they basically that was sort of the third version of East West Rail, if you will, <clears throat> that um, came, has come out in the last eight years. So now I come to this map or this chart, if you will, that I've, we've created, which sort of summarizes the sort of the whole picture. The red line shows the existing service today that's operated by Amtrak, the Lake, so-called Lakeshore Limited, which is this historic name of, of a service that uh, runs on to Chicago, one train in each direction. You've got New Haven, Springfield, Boston, which is what the Neary study said they should work move forward with. You've got Pittsfield, Springfield, Boston, which the second East West Rail study said looked interesting. And then you've got Amtrak, which wants Albany, Springfield, Boston. At the moment, it's not totally clear what MassDOT's going to move forward with. Um, it's just the, these are the options that are on the table. Um, all of them potentially are interesting. All of them have different ridership patterns. All of them have pluses and minuses. Um, but it's it's we're still waiting for sort of the word to come from Boston. What is this going to look like um, as far as moving forward? Now, talking about the political support, the big breakthrough I would say came in April of this year um, when Governor Baker announced that he agreed with Congressman Neal, Congressman McGovern and other po politicians um, in a so-called path forward for East West Trail. Governor Baker for many years has been, I would say hesitant to move forward with this project um, for lots of different reasons. Um, I think he would say that he needed more information, but eight years went by, two studies were done. And I think sort of from my take, there's a lot of federal money now on the table that makes this really something possible that could happen. And he sees that as a sort of the reason why we should now move forward with this. So you've got, you know, all of the key players here at the table. This is a Springfield Union Station. Um, you know, obviously they're smiling there, you know, it was a picture. Um, and so the political will, you know, for Governor Baker to be behind this project now is a really transformational step. For East West Trail, because going back the last eight years, there was really no green light for this project. They were happy to study it. They were hesitant to talk about it, um, but they weren't ready to move forward with it. Um, the missing piece in this, uh, which you can't really see in the picture, is you've got a lot of legislators in the eastern part of the state uh, that have, you know, maybe different priorities. The MBTA clearly has uh, a lot of issues, it needs a lot of money. Um, but the key here right now is that there is an incredible amount of money available uh, now, state money and federal money. In 2021, uh, the state passed a transportation bond bill with $50 million put in there for potentially for, potentially for East West Rail. Um, in November, 2021, the federal government passed the uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act with $66 billion, $66 billion with a B, for enhancing inner city passenger rail across the country. I mean, that's a lot of money for inner city passenger rail. We're never going to see, probably, that kind of money ever passed by the federal government again. So that's the kind of federal money that's there to make this happen. Granted, there's going to be a lot of states and, of course, Amtrak looking to use that money. But 
this, these are the kind of funds that can make Peace Press Trail happen. And then in August this year, uh, the legislature again passed the infrastructure, a new bill called the Infrastructure Bond Bill, which included $275 billion of state bonding authorization that could be matched with federal funds for moving East West Trail forward. The federal funds that will become available will be on a 20 to 80 to 20% match. So 275 million plus 50, you know, will probably give you somewhere around just north of two to two and a half billion dollars of money towards this project. Uh, to put that in perspective, the NERI study said this project would only take about half a billion dollars. So how much of this is really gonna cost, we don't know really yet, but the money looks like it was, is there. So what are the next steps? Um, when the legislature passed the infrastructure bond bill, they included wording in there to create uh, a temporary East-West Rail Commission, which is mostly made up of, of uh, legislators and the head of the planning authorities in our region. And they're going to get together very shortly to begin to discuss what the governance structure looks like for East-West Trail. Who's gonna basically run this? It's gonna be MassDOT or is it gonna be run by a separate uh, Western Mass Rail Authority, which is what MassDOT has recommended. Uh, there's pluses and minuses to each way of doing it. I, 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 I can't get into that here because it's they wrote a 30 page white paper on it. It's too complicated. Um, but needless to say, there's a, there's this commission's going to meet. Things are going to happen. And this is another step forward in making this potentially happen. Um, as I, there's a grant program called Chrissy that's the first round is coming out one and a half billion dollars and it's my understanding that MassDOT will have an application in there for some level of funding to move some of the early design and en engineering work I think I mean they haven't said anything but I think that's going to be included they're going to apply for some money to move forward with this in the as far as, as, far as the next step and clearly we're going to have a new governor in January um, and you know, that new governor is going to come in probably with a new mandate for how this is going to move forward. I think if it's more Healy, she's clearly said that she wants to move forward with East West Trail and she will appoint uh, a key person who will basically manage this project and push it forward. So now I want to sort of step back a little bit and sort of look at Amherst. Um, Amherst is not on the rail line, of course. Uh, but Amtrak does, I'm sorry, Amherst does have a rail corridor that runs north-south. It's often called the Central Corridor. It's the route that is used by the New, New England Central Railroad today for their freight service. It's also the route that was used by the Vermonter until it moved over to the uh, north-south route through Northampton and Greenfield. Um, we expect that there's going to be a new station built in Palmer for East West Trail sort of the logical thing that should happen is that Amherst needs to be connected, if nothing else, with a dedicated bus service operated by the PBTA to connect with the rail service in Palmer. So you could get on a bus in either Palmer or Amherst or UMass Amherst and connect and get on the train very easily without having to take the bus basically west to Springfield and then get on the train to go east of Austin. Um, that would be a logical thing to do, I would think. But in the short term, you know, where the opportunities arrive, it, arise, it's important for Amherst to continue to step up, you know, to support the need for East West Trail, you know, support the need for the new station in Palmer. Because if there's no new station in Palmer, that means the really the only option is for our whole region is everybody has to go to Springfield. And for people just east of Springfield, that means going backwards before you get going to, in the direction towards Boston. Um, and then thinking about a, a dedicated bus going to Palmer. Um, and in the long term, you know, because you do have the rail corridor in place and the tracks in Palmer are actually already lined to go to Boston, it would be really easy if you had a magic wand to make, have a train that went from Brattleboro to Amherst to Palmer to Boston or from Brattleboro to, Bo to Amherst to Palmer, south to Yukon and New London. Um, these kinds of things are possible, but 
we need to walk before we run. So we need to get East West Trail well along on its way before you start pushing for sort of the next step. But you know, one of the things we always like to say is if you want rail service, the tracks really need to be there already because it's probably in this country, we're not in a position where we're gonna put tracks where they don't exist already. Because if the rail corridor is not there, it's really, really, really difficult uh, in this country in particular to put a new train track in today. It wasn't so difficult in the 1800s. It is pretty difficult today for a lot of reasons. Um, so that's sort of the end of my presentation. I've tried to keep, I think, to the 20 to 25 minutes. I hope I haven't gone too quickly or summarized too much, but um, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Bruce, you should go. Yes, uh, thank you very much for all your hard work. Uh, my question is mostly about, is there any idea of what the speed of the trains would be? Would it be competitive with driving and with taking a bus to go from Boston to Springfield? Yep, just one second. Let me get my screen to come back so I can see you. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, so the, the, the plan is that the trip from Springfield to Boston, as example, will be in the range of probably an hour and 45 minutes. Um, I can't recall at the moment what the Pittsfield time is, but it's basically an hour and 45 minutes. And the speed, the top speed will probably be 90 miles an hour. But that really depends on the on the, the track. There's areas up in the in the mountains before you get to Worcester where you can't run at 90 miles an hour. Uh, but what they would do is they would get it up to the speed that they could, the maximum speed they could handle with the curvature uh, and and basically the track. But in the bottom line, they want an hour and 45 minutes. And and I assume this would be diesel rather than electrified. There's, there's no talk at the moment about electrified service, um, but so it would be diesel. Okay, well, thank you very much. Christine? Um, I wanted to ask, is the organization that you're associated with Trains in the Valley, is that a volunteer organization? It's totally a volunteer. It would, mm -hmm. we, we just, uh, we're trying to see this move forward. We try to sort of step into shoes where no one's standing in the shoes. And uh, sort of the most important thing I think we do is we, we've run a website which has more information than anybody has on this topic anywhere. Mm -hmm. So we try to make the public aware of what's possible and what they can do to sort of speak up to their elected officials. And I'd like to think that some of the work we've done has really helped to sort of move this forward at the sort of grassroots level, but yes. I know the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission has been involved in promoting rail travel in Western Massachusetts. Yep. Do you work with them? Yes, we, 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 we work with, we have worked with them. We continue to work with them. Uh, the former executive director, Tim Brennan, who tragically passed away was very supportive of our work. Mm -hmm. uh, and frankly, he was very helpful with sort of, sort of nudging us on to try to mm -hmm. you know, make this happen or at least from our, our perspective. And I'm just curious, I'm gonna just ask one more question. Sure. My former boss, Jonathan Tucker, was very active in promoting rail travel when he was planning director in Amherst. Is he still, is he involved in what you're doing now? Uh, I don't think so, no, I, I, don't, I don't know the name actually. All right, thanks, thanks very much. Sure. Anybody else? Well, I have a, I do have a question about um, just the north south rail. Like when you were talking about, um, like if it was ever expanded back to the east side of the east side of the Connecticut, like Brattleboro to Amherst or anything. I mean, I my understanding is that one reason that <clears throat> the tracks changed over to the west side of the Connecticut is that the tracks on the east side of this the river are in such bad condition. So like that seems like that would require a lot more infrastructure money and so on. Um, well, the, the, the corner that <clears throat> that runs north of Springfield was in incredibly bad condition 10 years ago. 
the train, mm. the freight trains on that line could only run 10 miles an hour for the most between Greenfield and Springfield. It took them four hours for the freight trains to get. Wow. From Greenfield to Springfield it was sort of ridiculous. Um, and a lot of federal money became available to, well, to increase the speeds on that line. Um, and now there's there's stretches where it's 80 miles an hour, um, including you know north of Northampton in particular. The line that runs through Amherst is primarily a freight corridor today, but I think the speeds there were in the range of 40 to 60 miles an hour. So it was in fairly good shape um, and obviously could be improved further um, if the money was there to do it. Um, but the real question is, put pasture rail on that line, there needs to be sort of a ridership demand mm -hmm. for, for running trains on that line. There was a study that was done to do that about eight years ago. And I think the study at the time in a different, in a different time period didn't show the ridership to build a corridor from Brattleboro to Amherst to, to New London. Uh, but it isn't to say that it couldn't happen in the future. The tracks are there. Um, you know, if, if we were to really start to transition away from the automobile to, to taking trains, like happens in Europe today, you know, the potential is there to make that happen. Well, and I mean, I remember seeing some Amtrak numbers about them since the Amtrak, you know, was expanded to have the Valley yeah. Fire and so on that um, the Northampton um, Amtrak stop is like had a huge amount of growth and it's like one of the busiest mm -hmm. stops. So it seems, you know, that there is a lot of potential if that was. Yeah, Northampton will probably us. have over 30,000 yeah. riders this year. Um, yeah. Post COVID. I mean, sure. I mean, compared to like places like Holyoke and things, with the ridership is like still so yeah. much smaller. Part so. part of the problem with the Valley Flyer and the Vermonter in the Valley is that it's sorry, the the fares that have been set by Amtrak are really targeted for intercity travel to New York. Mm. So if you want to travel from Greenfield from Northampton to uh, Springfield, the, they've set the price at twelve dollars. Okay. Nobody nobody's going to ride the train for twelve dollars unless you're on a joyride. Um, so we need to move to sort of the next step as to how do we fill empty seats with more competitive fares uh, for people who could want to go to Harvard. I'm sorry, Hartford, um, New London. I mean, we know that there are students who study in New Haven that take the train from New Northampton down to um, New Haven. But sort of part of the problem is the train comes back really, really late at night. So it's not very attractive. So we've got to move to this next step past the Valley Flyer to say, how do we make this work in a way that is not just for people who want to go to New York? Or yeah, I mean, I've taken it a number of times to go to DC actually. Mm -hmm. And um, the fair, I mean, the last time the fair was like, it was just, you know, it was like a $20, $30 fair, but, um, but it is like always late night, so. Yeah, yeah. Eve has a question. Hey, everybody. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, I want to say this is super exciting, and I'm really glad I came back um, to this meeting to, to hear this presentation. Thanks so much for, for doing it, and it's really great. Um, I had a question that was sort of related to what you said about people um, transitioning from cars to trains. I've been following a lot of the um, state legislation on um, how to decarbonize. So, and the clean, you know, clean energy plan and all that kind of stuff. And I know that, you know, the latest report basically said the next, the next sector that now has the most carbon emissions is transportation. And a lot of people are saying we need to think beyond electric cars because they're not available to everyone and they're not, you know, as much of an environmental justice. So um, one question is whether this is being linked to that plan and, and is there any kind of either political will or messaging or money that can be brought to this kind of effort to increase a mode shift that would enable this or support this? That's one question. And then the second question is, I lived in Eugene, Oregon for a long time and um, Amtrak um, contracted out to have some buses that run from Eugene to Seattle. So you could take like an Amtrak bus and that supplemented the Pacific um, you know, line that didn't run as often. And I'm wondering if anything is, you know, if that idea has been um, thought about for some of these shorter hops like the Valley. Um, I'll take the second question first. Um, 
I don't think there's been efforts yet to think about providing an Amtrak operated connecting bus, um, possibly because the service by the PBTA is pretty robust in our region. Um, with that said, it's not to say that it couldn't happen. It's basically someone would need to look, Mass would probably have to initiate sort of a mini study to look at what the potential is there to do it. Uh, Vermont is running uh, buses now that connect with their Amtrak service. Um, and I think it's been doing quite well. Um, the second, uh, sorry, coming back to the first question, I haven't seen a whole lot of discussion um, about people sort of at the governmental level that are looking towards how do we transition from uh, personal vehicles to you know, inner city rail yet. Um, our network in this country for inner city rail uh, is, is very thin uh, outside of the Northeast corridor, uh, with the exception of some states like Oregon, Washington, California, um, and, and around Chicago. Uh, we're sort of not really there yet to do it, but it is, doesn't say that we couldn't be there. It's, it's a different mindset to take the train. Um, you know, we're, we're on, the, on the Valley Flyer and the Volunteer, we basically, since it was shifted, seen growth in about 10 to 15% per year, uh, which is healthy growth, uh, but it takes time to get people to think about how do you get on a train versus driving when, you know, you've never done it before. You know, all my neighbors, I live in Hatfield, you know, they, they know what I work on and they say, I've never been on a train. So it's, it, it takes a while to sort of get over that hurdle. Um, so, so what do you think is the most important um, action item for um, us as a TAC? Do you have a suggestion? Um, I think it's important to follow what's going on and to be ready as needed to sort of speak up to make sure that our elected officials are, are really sort of pushed on this topic to move it forward. You know, my fear with East West Rail to be honest, is that it takes 10 years before we see a train run. Um, because these projects can become incredibly complicated. It's, you know, you've got to get trains to Worcester, which is operated on a quarter, rail quarter that's owned by a freight rail company called CSX. And then you've got to get the trains to run past Worcester on a quarter that's operated by the MBTA. And it very well could be the MBTA says, well, we can't run additional trains. Our tracks are full at the moment. So it's important, coming back to your question, that you know, the, the we have to keep the pressure up until the trains are running, basically. We have to keep the pressure up on getting a station in Palmer and getting the service running and getting the service running you know, as quickly as we can, even if it's, if it's an incremental build, meaning you don't have to wait to run 10 trains all at once. If we had two or three trains, I think most people would be happy with that. If you could get to Boston in the morning in an hour and 45 minutes from Springfield, or maybe an hour and a half from, you know, an hour and 40 minutes from Palmer, I think most people will probably be pretty happy with that. Um, and then back in the evening at a reasonable time, one or two trains, you, that, that'd be a great start. But I'm just saying it's, you can't, you can't just sort of sit back and imagine it's gonna happen because there's all sorts of reasons it can go off the track, so to speak. So, I mean, there are people, right, who can, I mean, when I first moved out to Western Mass, I was commuting to work in downtown Boston, and I would commute at least, you know, usually like twice a week. And a lot of times I would take the train, I would take the, the Worcester line or something. And so I would, right, drive from Amherst to Worcester and then get the train into downtown station. Um, Delta crossing. So, I mean, I guess the thing is, I mean, for people from, I guess from Springfield, it makes the most sense, I guess, to go to Palmer, but like from up here, like, you know, from Hampshire County, I'm not sure it would save a lot. You know, if I had to drive, like if Hampshire County or Franklin County people had to drive to Palmer first, you might as well just go right to like take route. I mean, there's even been like various, like the FRTA and things have run various bus services to get to, to, to the rail. 
mm -hmm. like Worcester or to get to the rail that goes into like North Station. Yeah, there is a PBT the line, like the Fitzburg line or something. So I'm just, I mean, so for Hampshire and Franklin County, it's not as good a connection, I think, Palmer. Right. I th there's two things going on. One is there's a PBTA bus that runs from UMass to Amherst dance, downtown, and then I think along Route 9 to Worcester to, to specifically connect with the MBTA commuter rail at the moment. I'm not sure how well that's doing. Um, They've tried various people. ones like over the years yeah. to try to get people to go to east, but some of them is like some of them kind of scoop through like a bunch of the hill towns and things and they're actually they take a really long time. Yeah. So and I think the other thing is that <laughs> there is there is the logical step would be that the sort of service that runs north of Springfield. So you could get on a train from Greenfield and connect in Springfield, step across the platform and go to Boston. Mm -hmm. uh, they would connect those services. So you Will be hopefully seamless. That would be the logical thing to do. Um, yeah. But that's that kind of thinking is pretty far down. We're not up to that level of thinking. We're just. Well, and, out and in terms of like ridership, I think the Springfield Boston connections, you know, just the most important in terms of right. attention. I mean, Greenfield is not. We right. don't, there's not as many people and everything. So. Right. And really, what's important too is that the train be able to pick up ridership from Hartford, because when they did the first study, it showed that the, the vast majority, or I shouldn't say the vast, but a lot of the ridership came from central Connecticut. So it was people mm. who wanted to get on the train in Hartford and get to Boston by Springfield. Oh, okay. So it's, you know, there's, there's a whole corridor of people between New Haven, Hartford, Springfield, Worcester, and Boston that want to see this service happen. Sure. Because if you're in Worcester, it's different. It's not so easy to get to New York City by rail. You sort of have to go into Boston backwards and then go down or drive down to, a lot of people drive down to New Haven. Yeah. So. I see one, I see a hand from Bruce. Do you know if there's been any more discussion of electrifying the line between New Haven and Springfield? So there isn't that transition of engines that takes 15 or 20 minutes? Yes, uh, Connecticut's actually, uh, I believe, about to initiate some level of study that's going to look at that. Um, because of the federal dollars that are available, uh, they're taking that up as something they're interested in doing. Uh, so it, it, the potential is there that it could move forward. Well, that would be good because it would save time going to and from New York and going further south to Washington. Yeah, the other thing that's happening is Amtrak is in the process of purchasing a whole new fleet to operate in the Northeast corridor. And the new engines will be able, so there will, will be some engines that can transition from diesel to electric without changing. Oh, that would be nice. Yes. Oh, well, thank you. Yep. Well, and isn't there something too that happened? I know I've been on the train in Springfield at Union Station and, and sometimes when it's running, it actually needs to like back up. And yeah. can you, I mean, does that, is that for all the like only some runs or uh, i mean because that's another delay that it's like yeah, what's that, that, you know that. what's happening that we have to wait for this so we're, we're we're still suffering from decisions that were made decades ago um the the tracks and switches aren't set up correctly anymore in springfield okay the support service that runs north and south so when the vermonter as example comes into springfield from from, from the north it's got to pull down and then back into the station and then head out. Oh. Uh, same thing with the Valley Flyer. Even though the Valley Flyer train set is configured to run in both directions, MassDOT's just kicked off a study, another study, to reconfigure all the tracks and to build a layover yard for East West Rail near Springfield. Uh, and if that project moves forward, which I suspect it will, the money's available they will reconfigure the track so these backup moves will come to a stop. You know, you just put, the train will basically pull into Springfield, change directions and pull out. Got it. Like I mean, the, the, you know, the, the revised station, the renovated station there is beautiful, but it just yeah. doesn't, it doesn't have like the whole capacity. They, they, renovate, the they renovated the station, they didn't renovate the tracks. Probably. Mm -hmm. oh. No, thank you. Yep. And so I don't know, we do have um, 
uh, Andy, are you still here? I know he had to run to another meeting, but Andy Steinberg is on our um, t town council. Yes, I am. No, and just in terms of, I, I mean, I was curious just to the extent to which the council has talked about like East West Rail or. I don't think the council that I can recall has ever had a conversation oh, about okay. East West Rail because nobody's brought it forward to discuss. Uh, I, I feel like there was like a resolution or something. But maybe I think there was a resolution okay. a couple of years ago. That's what I was recalling. Yeah, I'd have to go back and look. Okay, yeah. thanks. Christine. Hi, hey, um, you said that we should keep track of what's going on and um, what is the best method to do that? Do you think like reading the Gazette or well, what's the best way of getting information? Well, the, the, probably the best way is to, to follow what we're doing on Facebook. If anyone's on Facebook, you can follow our page, Trains of the Valley. Uh, we don't post very much and we really try to keep it on topic. Uh, we stay way away from sort of the sort of rail fan type stuff, people taking pictures of trains. Mm -hmm. uh, we're interested in getting information out to people that's actionable and, and useful for, you know, moving this topic forward. Mm -hmm. um, so that's probably the best way in, uh, to sort of see what's going on. Because if anything happens, it goes on our Facebook page. Thanks. Eve. Um. I was wondering if you'd reached out to UMass students because um, that seems like they could be great advocates for this. Um, we did reach out about four or five years ago. We had a couple of meetings where we were trying to organize um, sort of a panel discussion. And unfortunately we got into spring term and it sort of didn't happen. <laughs> um, we could try again, but um, at the moment we, we'd, we'd have to sort of renew our contacts to make that happen. If you had some contacts that you would suggest, I'd be, uh, I'd be happy to hear about them. Well, Tracy Zafian might be one of them, but. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> well, I don't, you know, work with students as much as you, Eve. So, yeah. But, yeah. yeah, I could be another one, actually. Yeah, I mean, there are a number of student groups on campus, so it might. I mean, I, you know, there is turnover with the students, but um, yeah, but there are a number of advocacy groups, so yeah. There's so much work related to climate change um, and people are really thinking in creative and broad minded ways about it these days. Mm -hmm. um, I just think that this could really be something that people would be excited about. Well, and I, and I think the most salient point that you brought to us is the fact that there's money available at the moment. And so having, you know, groups like like yours who have thought deeply about this for many years, you know, are really valuable in, in formulate, you know, having plans that are already formulated and connections that are already generated, mm -hmm. <laughs> that have already been generated right. for bringing ideas or continuing to, it, to enforce particular ideas that, mm -hmm. seem, you know, otherwise, I mean, so thank you for doing that. Like, you know, because it's, it, you know, no one could have predicted this money maybe coming, uh, becoming available, but, you know, it, since you already have kind of a plan and you've been active for so many years, I mean, thanks. I mean, really, what, really what's happened here, sort of, it, it, it may sound a little wonky, but the stars are, are aligned. Yeah, right. Between, right. I mean, it's been said by others, but between between Richard Neal, between the Western Mass delegation, between President Biden passing the infrastructure right. bill, um, between the money that's come out of the legislature, which is a big deal because it takes the legislators in the eastern part of the state to say yes to. Um, you know, it's the stars really have a line for this to happen. If it's and I think with the new governor, uh, you know, it really could really be full steam ahead as long as we don't get sort of ground down into the bureaucracy of MassDOT in the MBTA. Um, and it takes too long, but yeah. uh, you know, I think there'll be some real effort to make this happen as quickly as is feasible. Um, you know, knock on wood. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much for the work yeah. that you do and, and the volunteer work that you do now that we know that as well. Yeah. That's yeah. amazing. 
And that, you yeah. know, any of these advocacy efforts too, they just take so long, so. Yep. Yeah. But, but somebody does need to be Great the holder to of the information and the history and the real world, like understanding of how it works. So thanks for doing that. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks so much. Thanks. So, um, yeah, Ben, if you want to, I mean, Eve, I don't know if you were on some of the emails or whatever, so we can, I have Ben's information. And oh, can, Andy has a question yeah. right now. He has his hands up, hand up. Andy. I just wanted to confirm the information that had been discussed before that there was a resolution that was passed by the council and because I did go through the file quickly while <coughs> we were talking and uh, the resolution was uh, on 19th of October 2020. Mm, okay. okay. And uh, you can find a copy of it on the uh, town council page on the uh, website if you uh, go to the uh, bottom there's a uh, one link that says resolutions uh, council resolutions and then they're by year so you can find it if you want to actually look at it i thank you that's helpful i i wonder um if there isn't you know given given the fact that we've been told that there's this you know pot of money that's potentially available um, if 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 that resolution might want to be renewed or something added to it, or even just putting a uh, saying that it there's there's mm -hmm. the possibility, Andy, in in front of the council, like making just a one sentence item that you might want to put forward. Well, why don't you take a look at the resolution? As I say, you can find okay. it on the town yeah. council page. And then if you want to propose okay. something as a um, from TAC, um, cool. then get it through me and uh, I'll take a look at it and see if it makes sense to bring it to the council. Um, when you look, you know, I didn't look at the resolution mm -hmm. again, um, but as soon as you, so it was, was mentioned that it was done, I thought it, clicked but i i can't remember the content didn't read okay. the content now yeah. and i am um, gonna have to apologize yeah. because i'm gonna have to sign off in about yeah, one no, minute that's fine. in order right. to transfer to another meeting yeah, yeah of course thank you and I, I mean that thanks, TSA meeting is about to start but yeah well thank you ben thanks for coming today uh, and, uh, i will i will send you a copy of the pdf, PDF okay great presentation you can share thank that you. with anybody that you wish um and if there's any follow-up by email that's on the last page of the presentation just drop me a note and I'm happy to sure. answer any question that somebody might have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Okay. I know Guilford's going to go too. So. He wants Anything to be else? the host. Well, I'm going to run to the, the. Not me. To talk about parking. But maybe, I think that... maybe our meeting needs to adjourn now because I. Yeah, I, I think so. We're, lo yeah. we're losing enough people. I will yeah. just say, I. What do you guys? I mean, just a quick. Um, yeah, maybe one of us can just host for a minute or something. I can. I but can. Um, just in terms of our next meeting, do we think the TSO is only meeting once? I think in November. I mean, do we just want to have one meeting in November, possibly? What What is it? On, I mean, sorry. we don't really have, we're sort of wait, we're in a holding pattern a bit, a little bit right now. I know that um, the town manager, you know, is interviewing people for tech um, <clears throat> and, but we don't have I mean, too much that we've been asked to like, we, I mean, there are things that could be referred to us that haven't, I mean, I would like to follow up on some of the discussions we've had when we didn't have a quorum. You know, like yeah. we had that Valley Bikes discussion. That was pretty interesting. And to see if any of us hmm. want to work on those things. But actually, I haven't heard anything <clears throat> from the town about staying on. So. But did Marcus, had you offered to stay on already? Or I nobody has reached out to me about oh, anything. Okay. So, yeah, but I haven't heard either. Huh. It's a, they're, 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 they're trusting us. Well, I think the last time when, when my when my term ran out, I was told that I needed to have like submitted an application to stay, which no one had bothered to tell me. So maybe you need to do that. 
I, I submitted an application. I just haven't, I mean, I did this in 2019. I haven't heard anything. I mean, right before the pandemic. My understanding oh. from the town manager is that you know, there were people being interviewed and that he will be putting a memo to the council, basically goes through TSO and then to the council to say, you know, appoint a new person or two new people as well as I mean, I my appointment ended in 2021 too, and things. So I think he was planning to kind of bring them all to, as a group. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Because we basically have a committee of people whose terms have expired. So <laughs> a committee <laughs> of nobody. Yeah. No, no wonder we're not getting things done or whatever. So, yeah. um, but um, but <laughs> I don't know. I'm sort of leaning right now. It just November always feels like a busy month. So maybe we want to have one meeting. Sure. Um, but I will send out the, um, the information, trains in the valley info, and I'll look up the resolution. I also, there's information stuff going on at the state level. There's a beyond mobility project that Mass DOT is working on. It's like their long range transportation plan. Um, they did do one public survey. They actually have a public meeting tonight to discuss the project. Uh, but they, so they did one round of online surveys and they're doing a second one. And the second one I thought was really interesting because it basically wanted people to identify, say, say you had like a hundred, you know, a hundred points or whatever, like how much should go to different things, like where people actually have to like, you know, add it, allocate and add it up. So because you can't do everything at the same time in terms of like priorities. So I'll share that link as well. And um yeah, anything else? Oh, and I know that Rail Costner, um, Rob Costner had been in touch with us too about some study going on with um, economic development and the bike trail. There's oh, a great. To try to expand the bike trail like towards Boston. And I so there was a, happening, right? there, it is somewhat, um, but there's some sections. And one thing is that there's an economic impact study going on right now, you know, where they're, one, they're trying yeah. to assess the interest, but also in terms of, I think as they're advocating for the next phase about what the economic impact could be like in terms of people on the trail. But I mean, this is all for sections, um, the other side of Belchertown pretty much, right? Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. So I might just send out an email like with a bunch of these kind of links for people to follow up. Um, but if you had missed it, one of the things that we talked about with Valley Bikes too is trying to maybe you know try to maybe find some helmet like a program or something to get helmets and things because that that's a big concern of mine but that's not something that valley bikes is gonna take on so yeah um, but anyway but that was okay good so okay. should we decide on a date for a meeting yeah and i was just emailing um chris lindstrom because she's missed the last like three meetings and right. she does say that she Thursday nights are not great for her. I, you know, I, I didn't get a lot of details on that. I mean, it seems like this is when we've typically met. We used to meet at five because then it would have less conflicts with TSO. Um, it's hard to sort of move our meetings to a different night. Mm. Um, I mean, I think I'll talk to Chris on Lindstrom so she'll give me a call tomorrow, but um I don't know, do we want to just try to, but almost all of us are here right now and it seems like it works and it's good for working people to yes. have it after hours. Yes. Because I was on, when I was first on the public transportation committee, we used to meet during the day. So that would not work for me. That's, yeah. yeah no. So, no. Yeah. okay. So, so what do we think? Do we just, so I guess I prefer, you know, especially we want Andy to come because Andy hasn't been able to come because yes. he often has a conflict with TSO. Right. If TSO is meeting on the 10th, you know, maybe we just meet on like the 17th. Yes. Which I think after name. that next yeah. meeting. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I don't think we'll have new TAC members by then because the count, the town manager said it does have to go to TSO for approval. Oh, we might actually. Yeah, maybe. right. That would be the week before. Because, right. Yeah, exactly. So maybe we'll have new people by then. So Okay. 17. Um, maybe we've been voted off the island by then. So. <laughs> no, I don't I, think I, so. I, 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 was, I was contacted and I am to be replaced. So if I don't see you all again, oh. it's been a privilege and a pleasure. <laughs> oh, yes. Bruce. Yeah. Oh. They said but I you, might. You've been on for a while, so. Oh, absolutely. No, it's been a yeah. long time. Yes. And were you you were on what planning board before? You were on I was on the planning board for eight wow. years. Wow. Remember, remember, Chris? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I missed it. 
Yes, yes. So, well, thank you, Bruce. And thank you all. And I might yeah. see you again. It depends on when they appoint the new people, but yeah. they did say uh, that, and, and I agreed to be replaced. So it's not like I'm being uh, kicked off. I just was asked if I would mind. And I, I said, <laughs> I'm happy to serve and I'm happy to have somebody new you know, to, to, to join. Thank you right. so much, Bruce. Yeah, been, thank you. It's been yeah, a pleasure you. getting to know you too. Oh, thank yeah. you very much. I appreciate that. Yes, thank you. And, and maybe I'll see you once in a while, just as a guest. And on Absolutely. the bike, and on the bike trails, right, Bruce? Yes. And Get on out. The bike, on the bike trail, that would be exactly. true. Exactly. Yes. All right. Okay. Take right. right. care, everyone. everyone. Good night. Good night, everybody. Bye. Bye. Have a good night. Bye, Bruce. You too. Bye. Thank you, thank you all. Bye, bye.